Hey everybody, it's Ian King. I'm here with John John Park, son of the late Reg Park, otherwise known as Legend. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. And I know it's a special day, John John, for you, and, and obviously there'll be some mixed emotions around that, but um, you know, we're here to talk about the legacy uh, and, and, and pay tribute to what Reg stood for and, and, and the legacy that he left. And, and as I understand it, it's the eighth year anniversary of his passing. Correct. And you know, I've, got to, I've got to know Reg a lot through you, uh, I'm hoping that through the footage that we shoot today that more people get to understand the impact that Reg had on the world. Uh, you know, over time things can get a little bit lost, but you know, going back through his competitive history, if you want to bring us up to date, a bit about his training uh, and competitive career, you know, sure. where it all began. Sure, sure. Um, as a, as, a, as a, uh, a young kid, he was a very good athlete. Um, he excelled in uh, track and field and, and uh, football, what they call soccer here. Yes. And um, he was uh, the victor labdorum of both his junior and high school in track and field. And um, he was playing for, in those days, uh, Leeds United, which uh, certainly in the, in the uh, late 60s and 70s was one was of the top best clubs. teams in yeah. Europe. Yeah. But he was playing for Leeds United Reserves um, as a teenager. Wow. And um, he also captained the uh, Yorkshire Schoolboys. And uh, his goal was to turn pro. But he injured his knee and he started doing some uh, rehab work, some strength work. What year was this, you reckon? Well, I'm, I'm going to go back and say it was probably in the uh, early 40s. Early 40s, yeah, yeah. 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 And. Um, he was at, uh, during the summertime, he was at a swimming pool and, um, you know, it's in those days and certainly now even, uh, the weather in the north of England, yes. there's not that much sunshine. Yes. It was one of those rare days where it was a sunny day and he was at the local pool and there was a guy walking around who was a few years older than him with a very good physique, right. a guy by the name of David Cohen, and he said to him, what do you do? He said, um, I do bodybuilding. So he was very intrigued by that because he was always uh, intrigued by, you know, guys in good shape. And so he said, do you want to join me? And he said, I'd love to. So wow. he had a very rudimentary gym uh, in his home. And he did it for about three weeks. But he found it to be incredibly boring. But the guy's mother was an unbelievable cook. Uh -huh. And in England, you know, they have like uh, tea and high tea in the yes, afternoon. Yes, high three tea. o'clock. Yes. Uh, which is a full full on meal. Yes. And uh, the reason he kept going was because she baked so many good things that he he would love all the food. <laughs> um, anyway, it, it progressed, and then um, he was um, he was called up for military service. Uh -huh. um, it was just after the Second World yes. War, and um, <clears throat> he did his service. He did eighteen months in um, in uh, Malaysia, and. Um, one of the corporals saw him walking around because you know it was tropical weather, hot yes. all the time without a shirt on, and he was quite impressed with his shape. He said, "Would you like to be a PT instructor?" Oh. And he said, "Yes." So that's what he did for about 18 months to talk on to on combat and you know PE, and then he came out of uh, military service, and um, they had the Commonwealth Games in London. Oh, nice. But in conjunction with that, um, they also had the first ever Mr. Universe. Wow. And uh, he sat in the audience and he said, I'm going to win that one day. And the winner was uh, John Grimmick. John, was J.C. His, Grimmick? Yeah, yes. which was his inspiration. And wow. as you well know, Grimmick wasn't just a bodybuilder, yes. but he was a, a very good Olympic lifter. Yes. And he competed in the US, uh, for the U.S. team in the Olympics. And the second place was uh, Steve Reeves. Yes. And, um, Mr. V. Yeah. And so the following year, that was in uh, 1949, I believe. Huh? The following year, my dad um, had a very rudimentary gym. He started his uh, training in his backyard. And all he had was a bench that he'd cover with tarpaulin. And he rigged up a pulley system with a rope attached to the ceiling of the second floor. And it was so cold, he'd, he'd train in the rain and the snow. He'd wear three uh, sweatsuits, three pairs of socks, and military boots. And from there, they progressed to a corrugated iron 
um, garage with no electricity and no running water, no mirrors. And um, the rain and the snow used to come through the roof. And they had a tap uh, a little bit further down that fill up a bucket of water and drink there. And that's where his first training really started. And, and some uh, of those things are captured on that video. You did a video. Yes, yeah, some yes of those on, the, on the biography of him. Yes, yes it's in there. Yes. Yeah. In fact, my nephew plays his role. Is that right? In the very beginning, ah. yes. Yeah, the, the black and white footage, which, yes. was, which was very well done. Yeah, it was very well done. They tried to recreate that whole thing. Um, and um, he started winning local contests. I think the very first contest he ever entered uh, was in 1946. Uh, and he was, you know, inexperienced. I think he came fourth. But anyway, he started winning contests, and then people from all over England would come and watch him on the weekends working out. Wow. And there was one guy um, called Wag Bennett, yes. and Wag was pretty well known. He was uh, the first guy, him and his wife, they had a gym for many years that belonged to Wag's um, uh, father-in-law, and they ran it, and he brought Arnold um, to, to, to the UK. To the England, yeah. um, and Wag told me a story that he went to watch my dad train, and it was really old school. They had the dumbbells were not fixed like we have today. Mm. They were made up dumbbells. Yes. And he said he lay down on the bench and he was doing um, dumbbell flies. And the dumbbell, one of them uh, fell off yes. and cracked him across his nose. And he said he was covered in blood and he like got up and he shook his head all angry. He wiped the blood, he put the dumbbell back together and he got back down uh -huh. again and he carried it on. And he said he knew, watching that, that you know nothing was going to stop him. Yes. So he um, he entered the Mr. Uh, Britain, uh, which he won, and um, the night before the Mr. Universe, um, at the same venue, he won the Mr. Europe, and then he competed against Steve Reeves. Yes. Now it was Steve Reeves' first um, uh, last competition, and um, he has a famous shot of the two of them, and. I'm a little biased, but you can see who's a little bit more muscular there. Uh, Reeves was the name. Reeves beat him by a point. Right. But he came back in 1950. So what, what year was that one? Th think? This was this was 1950. Sorry. Oh, it was 50. And then he came back in 51 and he won it. And that was his first. Yeah, that was his first Mr. Universe. And this photo is this photo, 1949. This photo was taken in Hawaii. Yeah. Um, Diamond Head Beach. Yes. Prior to him winning the Mr. Universe. He, his father um, allowed him to come to the United States and he went to Canada, the East Coast, uh, California and Hawaii uh, and you know, spent time with all the well-known guys. There was a guy you would know by the name of Tommy Como yes. in Hawaii who yes. was a very good Olympic lifter. lifter yes. And uh, he spent time with all these so-called uh, legends yes. in the sport. The weeders were... Um, um, located in uh, the East Coast in New Jersey in those days. So he right. met all these guys, all these famous strength men. He went to see um, Steve Reeves in uh, San, San Francisco and he right. started you know, learning as much as he could. Um, so I believe this was taken in 1949. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he won the, f the first Miss Universe in, 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 in 1951. Then um, he was invited to go to South Africa by a group of theatres right. to perform um, during um, intermissions and pre-shows uh, of, of, of at the movie theatres. And when he was there, uh, he was staying in a hotel, and in the hotel there was a jewellery store which was run by um, my uncle, right. who was an avid sports fan. And uh, he invited my dad over to his house for a meal. And um, my mom's brother, Johnny Isaacs, who uh, was one of the original Muscle Beach guys. Okay, so Johnny here, yeah. Yeah, he was um, uh, also a former two-time Mr. Universe. Wow. Mr. Western America, America's Most Muscular Man, Mr. California, Mr. America over 40. But he had started bodybuilding. He wasn't uh, at the level that he eventually achieved. And he said to my mom, uh, do you want to come and meet Mr. Universe? And she had no interest whatsoever. But uh, anyway, he dragged her along and she was a professional ballet dancer. And um, he took her and my dad uh, had took, took one look at her. He had never said a word to her. 
and he asked my uncle if he could use the phone and he had a date that night oh. and he called and he cancelled the date. He asked my mom out and uh, he fell in love with her. He fell in love with South Africa with the climate. He knew that he was eventually going to leave England because he couldn't handle that cold weather yeah. and he thought that there was, you know, after travelling to the States and Hawaii, he just saw that the world was uh, had a lot more to offer and he wanted to go to a better climate. So um, he went back to the UK and him and my mom were in correspondence and ultimately he came to um, live in South Africa. When he came there he got involved with a guy who uh, owned a gym and he went into partnership with him. Uh, it didn't last very long um, because unfortunately he discovered his partner was keeping two sets of books. Mm -hmm. So they split up and he went on his own but my, my late grandfather, my mother's father said to him, you know, I think it would be a good idea <coughs> if you win another Mr. Universe because it would really promote your business. Uh -huh. So he went back in 1958. Oh, seven years apart. Yeah, yeah. and he so won the Mr. Universe again. Second time. Yeah. And, yeah, and he started this chain of gymnasiums which became very popular but he was also very ahead of his time because he started a big mail order business. And this is the 1950s? This was, yeah, in the late yeah. 50s. And he would sell uh, gym equipment and uh, gym clothing and training courses, some of which you have. Yes. And um, he would sell um, supplements. And he developed a massive mail order business throughout South Af Southern Africa. Wow. In fact, prior to coming to live in the, uh, in the States, he, uh, he had a mail order business in the UK. And he had his own magazine as uh -huh. well uh, called Strength and Health, yes. the Reg Park Journal. Strength and Health, yeah. yeah. Strength and Health, Reg Park Journal, right. uh, which became bound volumes. In 1965, uh, he felt that it was a good idea to, you know, have another boost for the business. So he decided to compete again. Seven years later again. And he won it again in three, 65. Three times, every, every time seven so years apart. So he was the first man to win it three times and the only man to this day yes. to win it at seven year intervals. Yes. Now, interestingly enough, we worked it out because most of the guys that he had competed against had beaten. That had he chosen to do so, he could have realistically won it 20 years in a row, which would have been unbelievable. But he, he said that after he won the first Mr. Universe, he stood on the uh, DS and he looked around and he, it, he felt it was an anticlimax. Ah. And he enjoyed more the experience of the training yes. and the camaraderie with everybody yes. than the actual winning it. He then retired and um, he was doing an exhibition in uh, London for Wag Bennett. Yes. And Wag Bennett said, there's a young man here who has just won the Junior Mr. Europe. You his idol and he wants to meet you. And uh, it was Schwarzenegger. Yes. And uh, Schwarzenegger walked into a bookstore when he was 14 and there was a picture of my dad on the cover of the magazine. And uh, he decided that he wanted to look like it. And he put my dad's pictures all over his walls. Yes. His mother thought it was a little weird because most teenagers had girls on the walls yes. and he had bodybuilders. And uh, he saw you know, all the Hercules movies of which Reg featured in five. And he molded his whole training and physique on that. At that time, my dad would bring out the top guy to uh, guest pose in South Africa every year, mostly American guys. And uh, they would come out during uh, December, Christmas time, and summer in South Africa, no to the country. And they would have a show in each city, uh, be it Cape Town, Durban, wherever. And at each show, they would have a local contest. And at the end of the show, at uh, the tour, they would have the winners of each local contest go to South Africa and compete in the Mr. South Africa. Yeah. That was the grand finale. So Schwarzenegger knew all about this and he said to my dad, when will you bring me to South Africa? And my dad said, if you win the universe, which he, he eventually did. And um, he sent my dad a, a, a telegram and my dad brought him over with some famous pictures of... So that's, that's the pool at, uh, that's the pool at home? Or? Yeah, this was at home. Um, and this was in 1969. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm wrong. This was in 1966. Seven, I believe, Seven. 67. And uh, so he was 19, and my dad said to him, if you develop your calves, you'll be the best bodybuilder in the world. And he, he would wake him up at 5 o'clock every morning, because my dad started training early in the morning, because the gym would officially open like at 8. 
but he would get there very early, and that started the whole evolution of early morning training. Right. Uh, and um, he wasn't used to it. And, uh, so Arnold wasn't used to training that early in the morning. Early. Yes. And he said that he thought, uh, in fact, when um, we had a memorial service for my dad here, which Arnold uh, and Maria hosted, he said that um, he thought he was strong because he was using 350 pounds on standing calf raises and Reg was using 1,000. So he realized that he had had a lot of work to do. Um, so in 1970, uh, my dad had officially retired. He wasn't planning on competing again. Before you leave that era, we've got pictures of you um, as a kid. Do you this is, uh, I was nine, so is Arnold's it? ten years my senior. So Arnold's 19 and you're nine there. Yeah. Wow. We see him with a cricket cap. He didn't know <laughs> much about cricket. But, and this was taken in Durban Beach. Ah, uh, in beautiful yeah. Durban yeah. Beach. Yeah. 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 So, um, Arnold was now living in the States, sponsored by Weeder. Yes. And he issued my dad a challenge to compete against him in the universe. Was, was a dead. friendly challenge? Yeah, friendly, <laughs> but there was some undercurrency there. Yeah. You know, I think he wanted to show his, his, boss. his, his mentor yes. who the boss was. Yes. You know? But, you know, one thing is uh, for sure that, uh, uh, with all due respect, Arnold admitted to taking yes. steroids. Yes. And my dad was clean his whole career. He, he refused to subject himself to that. In fact, so when, what year do you think that came into the sport? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I want to say that the, the steroids started coming in uh, in the mid-60s. Mid-60s, right. Yeah. right. Um, there were some guys... Your father had already won two at Mr. Universe's yeah, last stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were some guys who were taking, you know, uh, they didn't really acknowledge it, but it was common knowledge that they were. And um, my dad came out of retirement, he trained for three months to compete against Arnold in the universe. He was 42, Arnold was 23. Right. And what year was this? This was in 1970. There's a famous picture, which is one of my favorite, because I really believe, and I'm biased, that from a symmetrical and aesthetic standpoint, I think Reg had a far superior structure to Arnold. Yeah, and it was talked about this before. Yeah. The distance between, say, his, his neck and his abdominal is shortened here, yeah. whereas Arnold, uh, sorry, Reg is longer torso. He's is, is, is open. He's is, yeah. is open. So a it, smaller I, waist. And, and I think that impacts the uh, development of the upper pec. From what I'm seeing, when when they shorten this way and shorten this way, in those two planes, the upper pec development is not as impressive. And yeah. you see the upper pec development. And, and the lateral deltoids as well. Yeah, and the lateral deltoids. Well, yeah. because the anterior deltoids dominate in, in Correct. movements. Correct. And, and, and since you mentioned that, um, which was very interesting, uh, you know, Reg was renowned for his strength. Yes. The first man ever to bench press 500 pounds was a guy called Doug Hepburn. Yeah, Hepburn. Hepburn was, was, was a power lifter. And very heavy. He was a heavyweight. He was at least 270, 275. Yeah, come, up, come up around 300, yeah. Um, three, four days later, my dad was 225. He bench pressed 500. Wow. But he decided many years ago, he felt that lower pectoral development uh, was very easy to develop. Yes. And he didn't want to, he felt that his lower pecs were getting too heavy. Right. And it was um, actually having um, an adverse effect on the symmetry of the physique. Yes. So he stopped doing flat bench press completely. Uh, and he did only inclines. Mm. In fact, he, he, he did flat and he did decline, but he always felt that it really wasn't the angle of the bench that determined where you hit the pecs, but yes. the angle of the elbow. Oh, I agree. So, so he, he moved the elbow position to further back, so he only, higher elbow and he felt the bench was more for comfort level than anything yes. else. And I, I remember him showing me how you could work on a decline bench, but you could still get the upper pecs yes. just from moving the elbow. So he stopped doing flat bench press, and he felt when he got older, he didn't want to have that sag yes. look. Um, and I think that pretty much illustrates it yes. in that picture. Yes. Um, and then um, he decided actually, for whatever reason, to compete again. Uh, and he came back in 1971. He experimented. Was that the challenge he accepted with Arnold? You know, Arnold beat him in that competition by half a point. Right. We, we, yes. That one we just saw yes. there, yes. And here's Dave Draper, who 
Yes, you know, the, blonde, the blonde bomber. The blonde yes. bomber. Uh, 71, my dad decided to compete again for whatever reason. He felt that he could do better, but he experimented with his body weight and he came in too light. Right. Because, you know, he was over six foot and he was always a good 220, 225. Yes. Off season, even a little heavier. I think the most he ever got to was like 250. But he didn't believe in like the guys today and getting so, you know, huge out of season. So he didn't bulk up down. and come back and to he, any he great extent. He training up for it yes. more than anything else, you know. Um, and he came in around 250, which for him was too light. He had great lines, hmm. but he competed against Bill Pearl and Sergio Oliva. Right. Uh, Oliva was a little bit smooth. Yes. Uh, he came in second. Um, um, Pearl won it, my dad came third. Yeah, Olivia had beautiful lats, didn't he? Olivia had an unbelievably tiny waist. Yes, it just uh, popped freakishly out. Freakishly tiny waist and unbelievable lats. Yes. He wasn't great at posing. Ah. He was not a great poser, but he would do a lat spread or do his unique signature pose with his arms over yes. there. Nobody could do that. Yes. Um, but standing in the lineup, again, from a, from a symmetrical point of view, uh, he almost looked, a lot of people said, like a bigger version of Frank Zane. Yes. You know, with really nice lines, good, good physique. And he was known for his posing. Um, and here's where my mother's influence came in. Being a professional ballet dancer, she um, would go along with him to watch him do exhibitions. And she felt it was quite boring and she'd watch the local shows and she'd say, how come when these guys do their posing routines they don't use music? And he said, it's never, ever been done. So she said, well, you should start doing a posing routine to music. Oh. So they chose a classical piece of music called The Legend of the Glass Mountain. And they put this whole routine together. And uh, what, uh, when, 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 when it was high, he'd come up and, and, and do standing poses. And when it was low and more bass, he'd go down onto the ground. And when he did this, uh, he brought the house down. The so, went crazy. so basically, he introduced music so, to posing yeah, routines in, exactly. in, in the show. So that was the start of music in bodybuilding, and that's where the the, 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 the legend comes from, because of using the, the mm -hmm. music, the, the legend. legend of a glass mountain. Okay. Um, but you know, he ran this successful chain of gyms for twenty odd years, successful mail order business. And all the local physicians, this was long before they had proper rehab as we know it yes. today, would send their athletes to, um, or their, their, their patients uh, uh, post-surgery to, to my dad. And then a lot of the athletes started coming. And in fact, um, one year uh, prior to South Africa not being able to compete internationally because of apartheid, the all blacks came to South Africa to do a tour. And they had a winger uh, by the name of Williams, and uh, he got injured. And they sent him to train with my dad during wow. the tour to rehab him. So he was involved a lot in that. And then I know he did some work with was Bali Schwart in the lead up to the Bali Schwart in '95 um, the World, World Cup, Cup in South, South Africa. Africa. Correct. Yes. Another guy I worked with was uh, the World Ultra Distance Marathon champion called uh, Bruce Fordyce. And then also he put uh, uh, Gary Player's strength programs together for right. him. So he worked with a lot of different people. There was a, a well-known um, uh, uh, football, soccer player um, by the name of Richard Goff, who grew up in South Africa, but when he was 15, he was good enough to go to the UK. Right. And uh, he ended up uh, captaining uh, Scotland, Glasgow Rangers, who were undefeated for nine years. They won the Scottish Premiership. And he captain Glasgow Rangers in, in Scotland. He got 50 international caps. He played in two World Cups. Wow. And every summer when he'd go back to South Africa and visit his family, he would train with my dad and later me. But the one year during season he got injured and he called my dad. He said, I'm going to come back. They've given me permission to come home for three weeks to do rehab with you. He said, but you've got your own guys there. Why are you coming here? He says, no, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> so eventually, um, after running the gyms for 20 odd years, he sold them, uh, he felt he'd had enough, and uh, he wanted to have more time with the family, and because he'd worked long hours, mm. you know, up crack of dawn, come home at 8 o'clock at night, and uh, he wanted to travel. So he sold his gyms, and then he just started doing consulting work. 
and uh, you know, actually built up quite a big practice just working with people on a consultancy mm -hmm. basis. In fact, um, um, the um, coach of the Springbok rugby team, uh, the, sorry, the Transvaal rugby team at one time, uh, Ray Mort, yes. got my dad in to put strength training programs together for the whole team. Well, you know, this is amazing because I, I basically introduced strength training in Australian rugby. But when we went to Africa, when, they, when the apartheid ban finished in uh, 93, I think it was our first year going back in Africa to compete, the Africans were already well advanced in their strength rank. And, and I spent so many years wondering why was African rugby so far ahead of, say, Australian rugby in strength training? Right. And I think I know why. Yeah, well, he was actually, he had said that when, when he first went, they were training at the Wondrous Club. Yes. And he was actually very, very surprised in how archaic yeah. their methodology was. Yes. So he actually put them into groups, positional groups, yes. you know, because as you well know, uh, you don't play a certain position in sport because you play it. Mm. There's a physiological reason why you're good at that particular yes. pos position and of course him being aware of this, he divided them into groups yeah. and, did, and he started the strength training. He, didn't, he wasn't involved with them for a long time yeah. but he got them going and yes. you know and that was it. And then I was a competitive swimmer for many years. You represented uh, uh, Great, Great Britain, Britain in the yeah. Olympics. Yeah, because you know I, I swam in uh, the Montreal Olympics in '76, <laughs> and of course South Africa was was banned. But through my dad's birthright, I was able to get a British passport and compete for the for, for Great Britain. But he introduced strength training for swimmers. Yes. And he uh, developed. Um, uh, a pulley machine, very much like a functional trainer today. Right. Uh, and um, we'd go on a bench and the pulleys would go different Oh, the swim heights. pulleys, yeah. Then we'd do, you know, so do you think that was one of the first in the world that, that we created for swimmers? Because it was very popular after that. Um, I mean, it he, probably still is popular today. He, he, um, he had read up about the strength training um, for the US swimmers. Right. And he saw that uh, they were very into the Nautilus training right. for strength work. Yes. Um, he felt they were a little bit behind, mm. you know, in terms of the, the training, and he, he, he didn't, uh, he felt that the machinery was a little bit limiting. Yes. So he developed this pulley system mm -hmm. where yeah. you could not necessarily mimic the whole no, movement that's right. because, right. because it has a negative impact, but yes. certainly the pull through, you yeah. know, the most important thing. Wow. So then all the swimming coaches started sending their, their you know, their. their well, their he probably probably one of the first strength athletes to have such a following from a diverse sport, and he worked with so many different sports. Yeah, he, he, he did. I mean, tennis players, every, you, know, yes. you name it. I yeah. remember once in 1969 when we were traveling the UK and he was doing exhibitions, we went to Wimbledon. Yes. And he had one of his pupils there uh, who was actually competing, competing in yeah. Wimbledon. We so met him and he spent the afternoon watching. So in the 60s, maybe back in the 50s, you know, but definitely in the 60s and onwards, he was influencing sport. In a big through, way. I mean, through strength training. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, I remember when I, uh, when I was 12, I, w I was a huge soccer fan. Yes. And the local team in that day, the, the number one team was Highlands Park. They had uh, a number of expats and they had a couple of Brazilians, so they were by far the best team in South Africa. They were pretty much like the Manchester United of South Africa yes. because they wore the exact same strip. Right. Uh, obviously not on the same level. But they were very competitive in South Africa. And in those days, soccer cards were very, very big. So I remember one Sunday, I had my soccer album, and he says, "Bring that with. We're going uh, somewhere." So where are we going? He said, "Don't worry." So we arrived at one of his gyms, and uh, he says, "Come on, bring that with." And uh, he walked in, and the whole of the Highlands Park soccer team were waiting. <laughs> so for me, I mean, I, I was just, you know thrilled to see this. Yes. And uh, he put them through, you know, a strength training wow. program. So, you know, he became very renowned for anybody who had injuries, athletes, or really wanted to take it to the next level. He was the guy that they would go to. And there's a number of training methods yeah. that he, he innovated and introduced yes. to strength training, which yes. probably people yeah. don't realize. So yes. let's just name one or two of them. Well, the most famous one is the five by five. Yes. Yeah, five sets of five reps, which is world renowned. Today. Yes, certainly is. And what's very interesting is that, uh, as you know, over the years, I've been involved in uh, doing some strength and conditioning programs for boxers. And a few years ago, I was asked to go to Russia. Yeah, that's a great story, yeah. To, to train a guy who was uh, fighting um, Klitschko. Yes. Um, and his name was Povetkin. 
He was a heavy, uh, heavy weight. I want to say he was a good six four to twenty five pounds. And um, the very first day we were there, um, we were told that we need to get on the same page because he had a Russian so-called strength coach there who was more of a bodybuilder. Yes. And he had a um, Canadian guy who I gelled with, who was a chiropractor, who was very into strength training as you and I know it, yes. and very into the Olympic lifting. And um, I said while we're sitting down, um, first of all, I thought it was overkill that there should be three of us. And quite frankly, from day one, I could feel somehow or other this is not going to work. Um, and I said, you know, I'd like to do a full body analysis on you. Because I know you're the same. I don't work with anybody unless I look at them top to bottom, yes. front to back, lying face up, face down, the whole thing, looking at them walk. And the Russian guy was kind of, you know, brushed it off. He says, oh, he's already done that with a doctor. And I thought, well, you know, that's fine, but I don't know. Anyway, so I said, look, frankly, we've got two months. And two months is not enough time. Yes. I said, so in order to get him to the level we really want him to be at, I said, he'd need a few years, but we don't have that time. So I said, so we've just got to keep it very, very basic. And um, I was always um, frustrated with all the boxes I worked with because they'd let me know two, maximum three months before a fight. Yes. And it was to me, I always used to think, how come boxing is so archaic with their methodology and thought process and training? You can't expect to train for three months and reach your optimum mm -hmm. yes. And I had the same thing because I was involved with De La Hoya for nine fights. And frustratingly, I used to say, you know, if you look at any athlete, they train year-round. Obviously not at the same uh, intensity, but you've got to do periodization training. And he has to build a base before he comes to camp. So what was happening typically with these boxes is th three months is the most I ever had with De La Hoya, and that was actually when he was his best. But they would come to camp and you would start the base at camp where the base should have been built yes. long before camp. Yes. So you've got three months You've got maybe a month to build a base, and not even a, a very thorough base. And then, if you've got a month, luckily, to really train them at a high intensity, but then you've got to peak them and tape it. So you really only get two weeks. And so this was always frustrating to me. So anyway, the Canadian guy who, you know, as I said, more on our level, he turned around and he said, well, I'm a big advocate of the 5x5 five five principle. So I said to him, do you know any uh, uh, the history of the 5x5? Five five? He says, I don't, but you know, I use it all the time. So I said, well, I just want to let you know my late father invented it. So uh, the Russian guy turned around and he said, who's your late father? I said, Reg Park. He said, you're Reg Park's son? I said, yes. His whole attitude changed <laughs> towards me then. But it never ever was going to work because there was too many cooks. Yes. Um, I tried to introduce some, you know, very basic stre uh, stretching for him. Uh, typically, boxes are very uh, anterior because yes. they like this all the time. Yes. He had a very tight thoracic, and I looked at him walk, and I said, uh, we would have meetings every night, and it was like the Western crew on one side, and there's only a few of us, and the Russian crew on the other side and we were at loggerheads, and I said, if you look at this guy walk, you'll notice that when he walks, his left foot is always externally rotated. I said, and it's common because he's an orthodox box yes. and he's yes. leading with the left. I said, but yet you have him running in the forest on these long runs, which for me too was a waste of time. Yes. I started introducing interval training, um, and I said, and he's always going, in the same direction. Oh. I said he's always going counterclockwise. Yes. So he's always on that left foot and there was like a two mile run. So I said if you're going to do that, which I don't agree you should, you should at least switch. Yeah. And they started to do that. 
and his boxing trainer said, "You're quite right. He's um, he's much stronger on the left side." Funny, I said, yeah. "It's pretty obvious." Yeah. You know. Anyway, after a while, it, it, it wasn't working, and I, I said, "Listen, he's fighting Klitschko." I said, "Klitschko outweighs him. He's taller than him. He's heavier than him." And I can tell you right now, I said, "He's never going to compete with him on a strength level." And all Klitschko is going to do is lean on him the whole fight. Yeah. So eventually I ended up leaving early because it wasn't going to work. He wasn't listening. Uh, he came in with his strength trainer one day and they started doing all secondary movements like cable flies and leg extensions. You know, and we met with one of the promoters of, of the fight and we said, it's got nothing to do with what he's doing. And I said, you know, you have to understand, with all due respect, I come from a background. My dad was a world-renowned bodybuilder, but bodybuilding doesn't help, yes. you know, well, strength it, training. It's, it, there's no crossover whatsoever. Well, the same thing is still happening. I mean, we're seeing, same is happening. We're seeing, we're seeing I mean, to some extent, powerlifting now replacing the bodybuilding influence. And powerlifting has no more relevance, in my opinion, well, a little bit more, but some of the ways they're training for powerlifting are not relevant to sport. Well, if you take it even further, but just to digress and go back, I ended up leaving camp and um, he ended up fighting Klitschko and exactly without coming across as blasé what I predicted yes. happened. Yeah. First of all, it was one of the most boring fights I've ever seen. And all Klitschko did the whole fight was lean yeah. on yeah. And there's no ways he could fight him. But now you've got this new phenomena, CrossFit. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I remember you doing a seminar here years ago and I said to you, what do you feel about people doing deadlifts in a continuous motion? Yes. Because I've always, even if they're doing five or ten reps, yes. after every rep, I'm going to put the weight down, stand yep. up, take a couple of deep breaths, yes. and do it. He said it's the worst thing. So what they've done now with, uh, with uh, CrossFit, they've taken Olympic lifting, yes. and they've made it into a, a continuous... So non-stop, yeah. And all these people are getting injured. Yes. And I look at the CrossFit guys, and I have the same... Theory, I don't know how you, how you feel. Arthur Jones was a brilliant guy. Yeah, he was a very intelligent but man. He was crazy. He was a little <laughs> crazy. And I've adapted some of the Nautilus principles to yes. my training. Yes. But if you look at Nautilus training in its pure sense, I think, my opinion, that there's a certain physique that's suited for that type of training. Right. It's certainly not an ectomorph. Right. Okay, it's more of a, a, a powerlifting physique or a linebacker in football. Mm -hmm. They've got big joints. Mm -hmm. They can handle that load. Mm -hmm. I recently met a couple of weeks ago. I had lunch with some old friends in Huntington Beach, and Boya Co was there, right. who was a former Mr. America. Yes. 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 And he told me that he trained with Dorian Yates yes. for a while. Um, and he said that he knew he got strong, but he said his joints were killing him. Mm. And he said he knew he couldn't carry on training like that. Mm because there was no cool down period as mm. well. Mm. Um, and if you look at the guys who compete in CrossFit and even they get injured, they all have a similar physique, even in the woman. Yes. You know, they've got the big joints, yes. they can handle that load. And now I see a whole new phenomena that's happening. I'm not quite sure of the terminology, perhaps you know, but what's happening with a lot of people doing CrossFit, in fact, one of my clients' nieces just had to go into uh, surgery, is they're getting blood clots. Yeah from doing these movements on a too yeah. much time but under load. There are, ma there are many challenges with the training method. Right. So, we, br so. Be being brought up with Reg, it was like yeah. being raised in royalty, yeah? I, I, I think he was, yeah. it's in, you know, he had a lot of respect in the community. Um, he had done well from the sport. Uh, South Africa is a beautiful place to, to be brought up. Yeah, yeah, yeah much so. like Australia. Yeah, exactly. Very yes. we, we, yeah. We, we, our countries enjoy each other. So, what are some of the other things that, you know, in our closing, we'd like to just raise? I mean, I know one of the things that really impressed me about Reg was the, the legacy of his integrity. You know, that's something that really stood out to me, is that people really appreciate him as a human being and what he did for them. Whereas if he uh, had done the wrong thing by people, to, he would have left a little bit more of a trail of destruction. So, Well, for me, um, I wanted to get into bodybuilding because mm. I'd been exposed to it. My exposure as a kid was very different to most kids. Mm. On a Saturday morning, the kids would go with their dads to work and maybe doctors or accountants would run a, a garment factory or whatever. My yeah. exposure was the gym and I'd go in as a little boy. Yes. And I remember he'd give me a few things to do. He'd make me stand on a weight stack while he was doing pull-downs yes. or something. 
So I was exposed to different elements, and of course in those days he had all ilks. He had wrestlers, he had street fighters. So I was always intrigued by that, yes. the physicality, uh, as opposed to what a lot of my, most of my peers were exposed to. Um, but I wanted to get into bodybuilding. And he said to me, there's plenty, plenty of time for that. Yes. Finish your swimming career. My biggest regret today is that I never fulfilled my swimming career. Yes. And it wasn't like he was trying to discourage me from getting into bodybuilding. Yeah, it's kind of I realized later on, uh, because he said to me, today, I think it's virtually impossible without steroids. And I was naive at the time, and I said, I honestly believe if you have the right genetics, the right training, the right nutrition, the right attitude, you can do it. So I gave up swimming, unfortunately, prematurely. Oh. And um, it's my regret, because when I look today and I see, I was... Uh, 21 when I stopped swimming right. and I would have peaked 23 yes. to 27 so yes. I think I had two more Olympics yes. in me and when I went to the Olympics some of the guys I saw four years later were meddling yes. and even another four yes. years later but also frankly which I also learned from my dad I was also trained incorrectly because I was a sprinter and my coaches were carried away with over distance one, yes. work Recommend. and so glycogen depletion and injuries yes. but um, I came here to train. I trained with the former America, uh, Mr. America, Mr. Universal guy by the name of Bob Paris. We trained yes. together for six months. I made some gains. But I really then realized that, and even then, was nothing like today with the steroids. I mean, it was mild compared to today because yes. now they're doing the growth hormones and all sorts of stuff, injecting oils into their muscles and crazy things, that um, it was virtually impossible. So I got more involved into personal training. But you're talking about integrity. He never, ever compromised. He had the courage to compete against guys on steroids. And people often say, had he taken steroids, he would have been an absolute freak. Because already he was a phenomenon. Yes, yes. If you would have taken steroids, he would have gone to a level that probably nobody else yes. would have achieved. But if he refused, even uh, at the expense of earning a lot more money yes. and getting more notoriety, uh, he refused to compromise his ideals. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I never wanted to subject myself to that. Yes. Well, I've got this photo here of my personal training facility in uh, my, own, my own training facility. It's a phenomenal photo and I really appreciate that. And I think that that physique was developed in the 1940s. Yeah. And, and I think you know, anybody who questions whether the information has been the ability to make a physique like that, it's been around for like, 60 years. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a really good uh, example of what's possible. And from talking with you over the years, I know the way he lived his life was a very good example. Yeah. So we appreciate the opportunity to uh, be with you here today in, in Los Angeles on you know, the eighth anniversary of his passing. I understand it'll be a day of reflection for yourself. I wanted to just share with you uh, a little gift. You know, I know you, the gym's named uh, Legacy. the Legacy Gym, but uh, that's, you know, it's a, a book for a different reason. But to share some of the things that I've written. And, we appreciate uh, John John taking your time. Yeah, thank you. I also appreciate uh, having got to know you over the years and uh, sharing ideas with a like-minded individual. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. You're welcome. Thank you, thank John you. John. Appreciate it. Thank you.